All right. <clears throat> Welcome to Squid App Hacks. Uh, thank you all for bearing with us. It took us a few minutes to get up and go in there. Um, Squid App Hacks is a, is a time and a place for us to uh, team up with friends in the Salesforce world uh, to help you as you grow. Um, there's all kinds of lessons being learned by Salesforce admins, Salesforce MVPs. Um, there's, there's so much power to the, to the platform. And uh, so we want to be able to share that. So uh, if you join us each month on YouTube Live, we're going to interview MVPs, champions, admins, uh, folks that are in that space. We're going to talk about the latest tech trends, uh, app building, design tips, um, all the lessons that are being learned and shared. Um, that's what we're going to be getting into on these Squid App Hacks. And this is the first one. So uh, the next one is going to be on March 25th with Salesforce MVP Amanda Beard Nielsen. Uh, so please be sure to join us for that. Um, but really, really excited about this today. Um, my name is Matt Brown. I'm a product manager here at Squid. Um, and we are joined uh, this month with, by Shell Black, who's a Salesforce MVP. Uh, he's actually in the Salesforce MVP Hall of Fame and a longtime Salesforce consultant. So welcome, Shell. Thank you so much for joining us. Matt, thanks for having me. Yeah, all right. So uh, we're going to be structuring these uh, kind of like an interview. Um, we've got some questions we're going to go through, but we're going to definitely park at some of those spots um, and, uh, you know, have some back and forth, uh, share what we're learning, what we're seeing. Uh, so to kick us off, Shell, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, your journey in the Salesforce world and how you spend most of your time these days? Sure. Um, so I'm a little embarrassed to say my Salesforce journey is 15 years. Oh, yeah. Awesome. <laughs> journey, so well, old. Old. Be proud. Be proud. So I started um, as a Salesforce consultant for a firm back in 2005, working with just numerous different companies, trying to uh, help them achieve more with Salesforce. I did have an opportunity uh, around 2005, 2006 to teach the five-day admin class for Salesforce in one of their instructor-led wow. environments. Super beneficial, really helped me get solid on the platform and really get me even kind of more excited about Salesforce. Um, then I made a big change. Um, I be, went to the customer side of Salesforce and worked for a financial services company. Worked with them for about four years, got them on Salesforce, solved a bunch of problems. But after a couple of years, things kind of got in a maintenance mode. Um, around that time, I, I took and passed, um, got my first couple of Salesforce certifications just to make sure I was as good as I thought I was. And then um, I just felt like I needed a new challenge. So I actually created a website, shellblack.com, which at that time was not a business. It was just my blog. I was just sharing tips and tricks and what I was doing mm -hmm. with Salesforce and different solutions. And interestingly enough, um, companies would reach out to me and said, hey, I really liked what you were talking about here. We had some of uh, maybe a similar business problem at our company. They'd reach out for, for work. And then before I knew it, uh, it kind of snowballed into a business. It wasn't intentional. I, I, didn't, I didn't start shellblack.com as a vanity company. It was really my personal blog that turned into a company. Otherwise, I would have I'd named the company something else. Um, and then Salesforce uh, momentum just kept going on. Um, I started a YouTube channel. Um, I published a series of videos called the Shell Black Whiteboard, just kind of how-to instructional uh, series. And that's been super popular. There's been over 2 million minutes watched wow. on that channel. Um, and probably because of that, I got recognized in 2012 as a Salesforce MVP, was an active MB MVP for five years, and now I'm a Hall of Fame. Um, I've spoken at Dreamforce six years in a row. Um, and today, Shell Black is a company. Um, so we're a, a firm of more than uh, 50 team members. Uh, we've delivered more than 1,000 projects, and we specialize in financial services. That's our niche. So wealth banks, credit unions, insurance, benefits, mortgage lending, tax credit, and so on. And so my day to today is more running the company. Yeah. I'm still obviously heavily involved with Salesforce, but uh, my role has completely changed. So now I'm responsible for, like I said, more than 50 team members. That's, that's really great. And, and what I find fascinating about that is, you know, the, the market for Salesforce certification, Salesforce skills uh, just continues to grow. And it's interesting to go online and, and see folks, you know, switching careers. And there's always this question of, all right, where do I go first? What certifications do I go after? Um, what does it look like to, to progress in my career? So to, to, to hear that story and, and see how you start and then, and then where you can end up is, is really inspiring. And also, I'm going to go off the, um, off the beaten path here for a second because you, you, uh, you made me think of something. You know, 
it sounds like pretty early on you started to go from you know focusing on Salesforce into Salesforce financial services. And one of the, the themes that I, I seem to, to see a lot in this space is, yeah, go get that Salesforce cert, but then go deep. Don't just go broad. Um, look into specific Salesforce products and industries. What Maybe it's education cloud. Maybe it's financial services. In terms of career path, uh, how do you respond to that? And how quickly do, do you start you know, finding that niche uh, versus staying broad? Well, I guess it's, uh, you can kind of look at it two ways. Um, as an individual, you're always trying to stretch yourself, right? You're trying to learn more, grow that toolkit, um, that muscle memory of the platform and, and have as much exposure to as many product, products and features that you can get your hands on. It just makes you more valuable, right? As, as a consultant yeah. or even an admin. Um, if you flip it to kind of, you know, what we were doing as a business, as a strategy, you know, the first five years of shellblack.com, you, know, you didn't have financial service cloud, you didn't have CPQ, you didn't have demandware, you didn't have Tableau. It was just basically sales cloud, service cloud, and community cloud, which is now yeah. experience cloud. Yeah. So we were a generalist when we started uh, as, a, as a company, um, but as Salesforce kind of doubled down on, on verticals and we had so much critical mass in financial services, as we looked at, or as I looked at the business, I said, you know, final, financial services is a no brainer. Mm -hmm. right? We have a critical mass of clients, we're good at it. And then we doubled down on that, especially with financial services cloud. And the result of that focus is now 75% of our client base is in financial services. Wow. It, it snowballs momentum because it's more case studies, it's more references, it's just experience. And so you really start to resonate and connect with your end customers because you know their industry. That's, no, that's, that's really helpful. And it dovetail, dovetails nicely with, with where we're going next because uh, you know, what you're describing is not so much a technical skill. It's very much um, a higher level than that. It's, it's figuring out those strengths and capitalizing on those. Um, and understanding what you're doing well. So you, you, you and, and your team, at this point, you've designed, you've built, implemented hundreds of solutions across dozens of industries. Uh, but before you ever get to that build, can you talk to me about how you make sure you're building the right thing uh, for your clients? What does that process look like? You know, that's, that's a great question. And, and when you're a Salesforce consultant, it's kind of like being a virtual MBA because you're exposed to so many different business models, yeah. right? Yeah. Is it a product-based business? Is it a service-based business? Is it a recurring revenue SaaS subscription model business? And so you get to learn a lot about those business models, but what really makes you good at kind of designing solutions is you got to ask good questions, right? Yeah. And, and you got to learn to not be afraid to ask why why, what's the root cause? What am I solving for? Because if you work with a client and they say, this is how we do it today. And you're just cookie cutter replicating that into Salesforce, you may be replicating a problem. What you want to do is understand the business need and what you're solving for. And that gives you the opportunity to build a better mousetrap. Otherwise you just made the same mousetrap and you just replicated it. And it may not be scalable or portable or, or it may not have the, the flexibility that you need. And, and that's not to say that you can ever future proof a solution for 20 years out that's probably a little unrealistic but hopefully given enough time and budget you can kind of put that hat on and try to solve for that need by asking why and and actually build a, a better solution hopefully that made sense yeah no that's that's excellent and and it reminds me of uh when i made the jump because i started out at squid in sales learned our our tool and our product learned salesforce and then switched over to solutions to be a solutions engineer. And early on, the way that I thought it worked was, oh, the client asks me for feature X and I build feature X and give that to them. And, and I learned uh, over time that, yeah, that's kind of the first level, but you can actually build exactly what the customer is asking for and it be the wrong thing. Um, because you, you, need to, you need to dig deeper, you need to ask questions, you need to figure out what that problem is underneath it. And that's something that you know, I've learned from a lot of really great folks uh, at Squid and then in the ecosystem is spend time falling in love with the problem um, first before you ever go and start to build, you know, ask questions, dig in with the users. Um, so I, I totally resonate with that. Yeah, last comment on that, I would say, and, it, and it's kind of a rookie mistake. I, lot of see, I see a lot of young consultants or new consultants, and that's just, they're order takers. If you're, if you're just being an order taker, you're not being a consultant. You're not adding value. 
Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That, that, that extra perspective that is going to, is going to be able to go identify uh, things that you can bring in and bring that edge. That, that totally makes sense. And, you know, as we talk about things like user experience, you know, this, uh, it's about so much more. A lot of the time when, when, when you hear about UX, you think, oh, that's, that's what I look at. That's the visual thing that I see. Um, and of course, it goes so much deeper than that. And it really boils down to understanding the problem um, well and before, before you ever build a mock-up. Um, so, I, you know, you've, you've uh, seen a lot of Salesforce uh, in your time in this, in this world. Uh, so can you share any kind of UX usability testing horror stories? <laughs> uh, yeah, dish it out um, from uh, maybe before where you are at, you're at currently. And I think you were saying, yeah, there was a slide share a while back that kind of brought in some of that. So yeah, what, what are some of the things that you've seen? Yeah, before I get the horror story, I'll, I'll address the slide share question. So uh, just a long time ago, uh, one of the big primers that I had uh, about UX, and I think UX is incredibly applicable to Salesforce. There's a book that I really like. It's by an author called Stephen Krug, K-R-U-G. He's really a website usability author, and he wrote a book, and it's a quick, quick read. It's called Don't Make Me Think. And it's, it's got a lot of aha moment type things and really common sense, but he's really summarized them very well. Um, so that was kind of my kind of headset that I used when I was looking at Salesforce. And the slideshare references back in 2011, if you search on SlideShare, I made a presentation to the Dallas user group with a kind of a co-presenter, Matt Lamb, who's also a Salesforce consultant about just tips and tricks and how to organize information, display information uh, to make it easy and actionable and relevant to, to users. Just, you know, page layouts and how to kind of use the platform to your advantage. But it's, it's an oldie but a goodie uh, if you go back out there and, and, and look for it in SlideShare. Um, the horror story, um, the one that always kind of pops back into my head is I had a, a client and I was just starting off the engagement and we were doing a reverse demo and I was looking at their org and we spent a lot of time on leads and I had realized that uh, they had built out their entire <laughs> business process on the leads object. Oh, I mean, man. the longest scrolling cool. page layout you can imagine in hundreds and hundreds of fields to just to do the whole end-to-end -end customer lifecycle. And I, at, at that point I said, why aren't you using accounts and contacts and opportunities and the other core CRM objects? And they go, well, we figured out how to make fields on leads and that's as far as we got. And then like many years later, that's as far as they got. Oh, so, my gosh. Um, not ideal, but that's how, that's how they constructed it. And they had been using, using it that way because they really didn't know any better uh, for years. Yeah. So that's, that's probably the one that, that, that I always think of. No, that, that makes me, that reminded me of one that I saw at one point where, um, they had an inventor object and an invention object, and they wanted to have multiple inventors associated with one invention, and uh, multiple uh, and one inventor could have multiple inventions. And at that time, I was watching through all the the Salesforce 401 videos or whatever the, it was, to, you know, to get in. I was like, oh, that sounds like a junction object. And then they showed me what they did, and they had an inventor one field, an inventor <laughs> two field. Inventor three field, inventor four. And I was like, oh, I, I think that's not good. I, I don't think that's, that's going to end up being a good solution for you. Um, so yeah, I, that, I, I totally get it. Because once you get, in, get into something and you find a solution, and once you got a, a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Exactly. Uh, so no, that's, that's good. So, okay, so you, you talked about initially, in terms of where Salesforce was, it, it used to be... Um, just kind of a, a, a one size fits all bucket. Uh, and as they, as the product has grown, as the platform has grown, you've gotten more uh, vertical solutions, uh, a lot more tools that have gotten uh, in there. So you and your team have, have focused more and more on uh, financial services. Um, so what are some, some trends, use cases, best practices that you've seen in that space? Um, specifically, you know, building Salesforce apps for clients in that industry. Yeah, that's a, that's, that's, a, that's a great that's question. A great question. So it, I'll pick wealth management um, it, as, as an example. And there's, there's a lot of folks in financial services that have access to a ton of data and visualizations become more and more important uh, because they have so much data and it's in so many different objects, you know, navigating and assessing and kind of getting that big picture view 
uh, requires a lot of clicks, a lot of drill downs and backing out and looking at something else. Uh, and that can be very clunky and time consuming. And so we get a lot of requests on how to kind of surface up information and, and make it actionable. And I'll give you a couple of real world examples that we've seen. So we had a, had a wealth management client a couple of years ago that told me that they wanted a med chart. And that, and that was a big head scratcher for me initially because they're talking like doctors and they're you know, uh, wealth management uh, personnel, uh, advisors, wealth advisors. But the analogy they were drawing was, was, was absolutely on target. So if you think about um, a doctor's office where there's multiple doctors, maybe it's an or orthopedic group and you know, your doctor's out and another doctor is seeing you for an injury and they need to quickly look over your med chart and kind of understand um, your history. That could be you know, medical history with your family, what meds you were on, what past procedures you've had, but it allows that doctor to walk in the room and talk intelligently and make good intelligent recommendations. Same scenario for a financial advisor. So if you have some kind of a life event um, that comes up and another advisor is covering for an advisor that's out, they need to know, you know, what's the risk tolerance of that client? What's their investment strategy? What assets are they managing at the firm on behalf of those clients? Are they properly insured? Do they have estate planning docs? Are there trusts and beneficiaries? They need all that information at their fingertips, a one or two pager or one or two screens to be able to quickly assess kind of the health in that relationship so they can walk in or take that phone call from that client and make intelligent recommendations. So great analogy, but it's all about servicing data and, yeah. and, and making it actionable for them. Which, and, and that's something, you know, obviously Salesforce has focused a lot on that and their messaging around customer 360 and this idea of a, of a holistic view, single pane of glass kind of thing. Um, of course, the devil's always in the details though, right? Because it's like, all right, that's great that I've got all this data. How do I actually make it so that I can see it in one, in one view? which is where uh, y'all's expertise is going to come to come into play in, in building that kind of thing. Because the other thing, the value of the med chart example in the medical world is that you, uh, you don't, hopefully you don't have to train someone on how to navigate that page uh, right. the first time they see it, you know, cause we don't, we don't want to spend, you know, tons of time and money on having to train people on, on how to use that. So having that user experience that surfaces it up, uh, makes it so that someone come, can come in and maybe they're even seeing that page for the first time because they're a new employee or something like that and they know what they're looking at. And that ties into something else that you mentioned to me because a lot of the time, you know, companies, whether they're um, in the, the wealth management space or financial services, but, but also enterprise customers that we work with, a lot of the time they're growing by mergers and acquisition. And so they're pulling in new groups of, of people that all of a sudden have to use the system and they have to learn it. So one thing you mentioned to me was tech stack as differentiator for firms that are growing that way. But can you talk a little bit about what you mean by that? Yeah, I'll go back to wealth management again. So, you know, wealth management is all about AUM, asset center management. And you can grow that organically by you know, getting referrals and growing your clients or growing more wallet share within that client base. The fast way that firms grow AUM uh, is acquisition. They will buy another practice and acquire another practice and they'll take that AUM and they'll merge it together. And one of the things I've seen in the industry as a trend is, uh, to your point, it's a tech stack being a differentiator. Um, advisors, their skill is managing clients and managing money, right? It's those relationships they build and how they manage money. Not, not to be a blanket statement, but they're not good at IT and, and technology. That's mm. not how they were trained and brought up. It's not really um, yeah. And so a lot of the bigger firms have looked, looked at their tech stack or their CRM like Salesforce as a competitive advantage mm. that they're going to invest in, in a couple of areas, what we call AX, the advisor experience, to make sure that it's, again, as we talked about surfacing information and making it actionable, as well as CX, which is the client experience. So maybe a community or a portal oh, yeah. where the end client can go on there and see, you know, how's their investments doing? How are things trending? How are they progressing towards their life goals? Maybe there's a planning checklist. That if when you're a bigger firm, you can invest in that technology, and it makes it an attract uh, makes them attractive. So if they do have an acquisition conversation, an advisor may want to join another firm because they have better technology that will yeah. ultimately help make that advisor make more money, That's right? Good. And they can focus on what they're good at, which is the client relationship, and they don't have to worry about the technology. So 
a lot of firms have used that as a way to make it attractive uh, or a good, you know, a suitor for, for acquisitions to smaller firms. No, that's, that's huge. And, and, and I think it crosses industries too, because, you know, to your point, if I'm thinking about the technology, that means I'm not actually thinking about the, the business problem that I'm trying to solve in that moment. You know, and, and I think that Salesforce has all this power of the data model underneath it. Um, but if you're constantly having to ask yourself, okay, wait, which object is this in? Um, uh, which, which data source is coming from? How do I get there? Um, that's, that's time, that's mental load. Uh, and if you can have something that, that just serves that up, yeah, it saves, saves a lot of time. Um, cool. So uh, in your progression, uh, Shell Black as an organization has grown. Um, and you're not necessarily in the nuts and bolts of, of building and implementing solutions anymore. You're thinking at a little bit of a higher level. So uh, how, when it comes to either your organization or, or maybe one of your clients as they have a Salesforce org, what does it look like to think about these problems that we're talking about at that higher level, building a team, operationalizing uh, how I think about solving problems um, not just solving the problem that's right in front of me, but what's my framework for solving problems? And what's my, how, what does my team look like? How are you guys doing that? How are you thinking about that? I think that's a great question. I think from an operational standpoint, when we're looking at a consulting practice like ours, um, consistent quality delivery is a huge goal of ours, hmm. right? Consistent quality delivery. If we're very consistent in our approach and our methodologies and the tools that we're using, we're going to mitigate risk and we're gonna have a better quality deliverable uh, to our clients. You know, if you have a new consultant and then for example, at Shell Black, when you join, we have a four day onboarding and it's not to teach you how to use Salesforce. Huh. You know how to use Salesforce. It's really to understand how we deliver success to our clients. What's, what's the process? What are the tools um, we use? Um, and, and what we're trying to do is make sure that when we throw a, a consultant to an engagement, they're not recreating the wheel. They're not going rogue. They're not off-roading because when you off-road, it's going to bite you, right? Yeah. You're going to do something wrong. We've already made these mistakes as a consulting firm over 10 years. Let us teach you all the learnings yeah. uh, of, uh, and best practices, how to do that to make sure you have quality, successful delivery. Mm -hmm. um, not surprising, we use Salesforce super heavily. Um, we used to have a project management tool inside Salesforce as an app, an installed package that we outgrew. And now we use Asana, which is kind of more mm -hmm. of a, enterprise industry tool. Yep. And um, uh, we use that to help, because um, Asana has a lot of checklists and templates, again, so we have reusable assets for project delivery, so we don't have to recreate the wheel. Yeah. No, that's that's really helpful, and it, yeah, and I've, I've felt a lot of the same, same thing as well. For us at Squid on the services side, you know, one of the shifts for us was getting, you know, more from a, a project management uh, perspective to more of a product management uh, mm -hmm. perspective. Of, you know, we're not just completing this this project. How do you actually have a product so you hand it over to the customer? They understand what they're getting. They understand what it's like to manage this and add value over time. And uh, you don't want that to be someone something where every solutions engineer has their own flavor of what that looks like. Um, so getting to the same same ideas, the same principles, so that yeah, it's it's reproducible. That yep, I, I resonate with that. Um, all right, so so last last question here. Um, uh, you've you've gone through a lot. You've learned a lot of lessons. There's a lot of folks uh, either just now joining the Salesforce space or on the outside looking in, and they're wondering, you know, what does it look like for me to jump in? Where should I go? Any advice that you're going to give to uh, new Salesforce admins, uh, new app app builders and managers out there? Yeah, I think it kind of goes back to one of my earlier clients comments and that's just stretching and growing and exposing yourself to as much as the platform as you can. It's, mm. it's really easy, especially if you're an admin in an existing company to kind of get into a rut. Yeah. Um, and it, if your company only has sales cloud, you only know sales cloud, right? Yep. You're not getting exposed to other products and features. Maybe you don't get, ever get a chance to get your hands dirty and get hands-on experience with marketing automation. So, you know, how do you solve for that? That's a tough one, but I would say, be proactive. You can kind of put the hat on of a BA or a business analyst. Go see if you can make the business case of why your your company would would you know um, gain value from marketing automation, 
or maybe Service Cloud or Tableau or something like that or Einstein Analytics. So uh, see if you can make the business case for that. So if you really do want that exposure, take some initiative. Yeah, no, I, I, I love that. And, and that's something that, um, yeah, it takes, it takes some guts uh, to, to go do that, to make that pitch. Um, but also from a, a product standpoint, that's something that we thought about, you know, at Squid a good bit, because it's like, how do we market features to our, our customers so that they get more value out of the product? And when you look at Salesforce Trailhead, they, they're doing the same thing, right? Like that's, that's enablement, but it's also marketing. Um, but the thing is, it's, it's also better for the, the person. It's better for the admin. Uh, to go and explore. Um, and um, yeah, there's, I, I've heard some really great stuff from other Salesforce MVPs, folks in that, in this space that are like, yep, go deep, go broad, expose yourself to all that stuff because you're going to find some unexpected opportunities there. Yeah. I'll, t- I'll give you one more tip. And that's uh, it's one that I stole from a, another Salesforce MVP, Gary Palmatier. He used to challenge his team at his company. He also runs a consulting firm, Red Argyle. So I'll give a little shout out to them. But when the release notes came out, they would try to find three features they could take advantage of in the release notes. Oh every, yeah, every, yeah. Every, every, every cycle. Yep. And if you give yourself that kind of goal, again, you might find some value in company on just the existing software that you have. And now you've got some hands-on experience with a new feature. Yeah, no, that's a great challenge. Um, and yeah, so I feel that scramble whenever there's, there's a new release. Um, and there's always something good there. Um, so, well, uh, Shell, thank you so much for joining us. This has been absolutely fantastic. Great to get that perspective on the, the trajectory of, of a Salesforce career and where it can go. Um, it seems like uh, if, you're, if you're staying in it and if you're exploring, uh, no year is going to look the same as any other year. Um, uh, there's, just, there's a ton of excitement and opportunity there. Um, so thank you for sharing that. Um, great to hear what you guys are doing and excited to hear more uh, here in 2021. Matt, my pleasure. Thanks for having me again. All right. Well, um, we're going to wrap up here. Um, we, we have a raffle winner. Uh, Chandana uh, Bisu is uh, this month's winner. So Chandana, be on the lookout for that. That's an Amazon gift card that should be coming your way. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us. We've got another one coming up on March 25th with uh, Salesforce MVP Amanda Beard Nielsen. That's going to be fantastic. So sign up today. We hope you join us each month. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Shell. Uh, Y'all have a great day.